Walker. And this patchwork, uh, piece of patchwork, I figured kind of, while I do my little intro, we can think of the patchwork that our town is and the patchwork that Cross River is. Once again, it's a hamlet that's been shaped by a river, roads, and finally the reservoir. So it's, it's again, like Golden's Bridge. It's got the, Golden's Bridge, I think, had four R's, but Cross River has those three R's, the river, the road, and the reservoir. It's always been a crossroads, and the name Cross River doesn't come from the fact that it's a crossroads, but from a man named John Cross, who named Cross Pond, which is now Lake Kichewan, and the river or the stream that came from that lake wound its way around what's now the reservation and into the park. Uh, and again, into the, uh, eventually it made its, the Cross River made its way all the way over to Katona and joined the Croton River, which made it one of the reasons why uh, New York City wanted a, a supply of water and turned these rivers in Upper Westchester into reservoirs. So it's always been um, crossroads with rivers. There's a river, uh, if you look carefully, by uh, not too not too far west of uh, Fifth Division Market, there's a river coming in, and I believe that's the Indian River, which flows behind 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 the John Jay um, campus, the two the two schools. There's a river back there, which is which is empties into the reservoir now. It's been a center of commerce in all of the years from the 1700s on. It's been a center of families. Some of the founding families still have people, one or two of their, their uh, descendants still living here. It also, it used to be a center of, of worship. However, times change, people move away, congregations kind of uh, linger for a while, and then unfortunately die out, literally. And you'll find their participants up in the cemetery, which we'll be visiting at the end of our little talk. So I'm hoping to let the pictures tell the story of the three centuries from the seven, late 1700s to the present day. There are so many pictures in my archives and that I've collected of Cross River. So it's, it was hard to choose just the ones I did and we're almost up to 70 pictures. So a lot of times it'll just be a picture with nothing really to, uh, to tell except to explain what the picture is. What we're looking at now is one patch of a log cabin quilt that belonged to the Russell family. Cyrus Russell was at one point called Mr. Lewis Bro. He was a supervisor for almost 10 years back in the 60s. Uh, we'll talk more about his family later, but um, Hazel Russell, Cyrus's wife, had a collection of almost a dozen quilts that were all made locally in Cross River, a few Bedford people and a couple of Ridgefield people. And these quilts are now uh, safely locked away in the town vault since all of the Russell family, uh, local Russell family has passed away and the quilts were given to the town. So when we can get back together in person, um, I'd love to have another quilt show. We did a quilt show about 10 years ago and displayed the quilts. And it's time for another, another look at Cross River. This quilt probably dates from the 1850s to the Civil War time. So uh, it's a log cabin quilt and it's one of the more spectacular of those, of those quilts. Now, Cross River, I love this picture. This to me is a happy celebration. This is a picnic somewhere. And the first theme of this uh, gathering is Cross River is a picnic, a place of picnics. This, this looks like it's the uh, late, 17, late 1800s, maybe around 1900s. And quite a few of those people are uh, having something some sort of libation, at least the, the gentlemen are. Well, I see one lady. And this may be in the area that is now 
Ward Pound Ridge Reservation, or uh, it might be any other farm field, but I'm not going to get in too close on those beer bottles, but here is what they might be drinking. On your left, you see a bottle that says Scott Piat Cross River. Scott Piat lived uh, right, his house when it was extant would have been found behind the Trailside Museum up on the res. But Scott was a, a farmer, a basket maker, and here's one of, on the right, you see one of Scott's baskets. Both of these items are um, the property of the Trailside Museum on the reservation. But <clears throat> Scott would uh, bring whatever he had to sell, or I guess he also um, did some, some um, wood cutting. He'd bring his logs into the depot in Katona. And we're talking the, uh, the last half of the 1800s, maybe the first half of the 1900s. Uh, He'd bring his bring his um, whatever he had into the into the into, into Katona, take it to the railroad station, get rid of whatever he had to to uh, put on the freight train to go back to New York, and coming from New York would have been barrels of Schaefer beer. He Scott would take the barrels back home to his house in Cross River, and bottle up the Schaefer beer and label it as Scott Piat beer from Cross River. At picnics. Uh, this is one of my favorite gravestones up in the Cross River Cemetery. Uh, and then I happened to meet via Zoom, the gentleman whose father this is. This was the, uh, both Ruth and Reginald are buried up, a husband and wife are buried up in the newer part of the Cross River. Reynolds Cemetery. But ever since I first started uh, looking hard at gravestones up in the, in, the, uh, in the cemetery, this one stands out because Reg Townsend had as his epitaph, God packed my picnic basket. And I thought that kind of fills in. We saw the people having a picnic. We saw what they were drinking. And now we can see that the picnic is continuing forever. All right, I don't know a whole lot about the, uh, the Native American presence in Cross River. We certainly know that they were there. This is Bear Rock and uh, probably a bunch, a lot of you, if you are local, have been up to the reservation and have uh, gone on the trail up to Bear Rock. This rock was um, probably uh, uh, first, if not discovered, first uh, mentioned in any kind of, of, uh, of uh, information when Nick Shumatov was curator up at the museum. And he and some teenagers were walking along one of the trails and they discovered this rock. It's way up past where the, uh, the uh, electric wires go through the res. But supposedly it has the head of a bear. That's why it's been called Bear Rock. And there are apparently, there are some other pictographs on this rock. And so Nick, who was uh, a collector of uh, Delaware Lenape Indian, Indian uh, information has uh, figures, it really is something that does date from, it could be as much as 3000 or longer, 3000 years ago or longer, because there are other indications that there were Indian uh, villages or at least uh, seasonal villages in the reservation. There's a big rock shelter on uh, the rock shelter trail. And uh, uh, we know that there were encampments along the, uh, the, cross, the uh, cross River, which goes behind JT Farm. It, it forms the, uh, the uh, boundary of JT Farm and the reservation. And, Years ago, back in the 70s, there, there was an archeological dig which did turn up uh, Indian, Indian artifacts there. And I think if uh, you ever get a chance to do any exploring, if the reservoir ever goes down again, you might have a, a chance of seeing where possibly there, there could have been a, um, there was a stream there. So any place there's a stream and good vegetation, source of food, source of water, you might find 
uh, a Native American present. So we're going to consider that uh, 3,000 years ago until uh, the early 1700s, there was a Native American presence in Cross River as there was in the rest of the town. Then we're going to fast forward to 1781 and Rochambeau uh, landed when the French came to help the Americans during the revolution. Rochambeau's forces landed in Newport, Rhode Island, marched across uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut, came down from Newtown, Connecticut to North Salem. Here we are on 121, coming down to where Holly Mountain Road comes off of 121, back behind Mountain Lakes Camp. Rochambeau's forces came from uh, North Salem to Holly Mountain, came in Holly Mountain Road just until it hits what on that part of, uh, since it's still North Salem, it's called the Old Post Road, but it's, we call it Mead Street. And Rochambeau's troops marched uh, between July 1st and July 3rd in 1781. Uh, I don't remember which day it was exactly, but they were on a forced march. They came along Mead Street, all the way down Mead Street to where uh, Route 35, this would be the corner of Mead and what we call Route 35 today. And they marched along uh, the Post Road, wouldn't have been called Route 35. And then up Mark Mead, Mark Mead, because this is an older part. This is this other part, which we now know as Route 35, was built in the 30s. And so we come down here to the bridge at uh, 121 again, where 121 goes off toward Bedford. And uh, uh, Rochambeau continued on this way until he met Washington's forces down at, New at North Castle. So if you happen to be a, a child, out sitting on your front bank at uh, on July July 1st or 3rd in, in 1781, you might have seen the French soldiers in all those wonderful bright uniforms they had. Um, Nathaniel Reynolds, we just I just took a quick side trip up here to the uh, cemetery, Cross River Cemetery, because uh, <clears throat> the cemetery houses a few graves from the revolution many more from the Civil War. There are a lot of Civil War soldiers buried up here and uh, it probably behooves me as town historian to get a committee to try to document the Civil War soldiers in, in town because there were a lot. But Nathaniel uh, served in the Revolutionary War. He was one of the, the progenitors of the Reynolds family in Cross River and the Reynolds family was a founding family in Cross River. Daniel was born in 1754 uh, and he died in 1843. But in between that time, he served as a revolutionary soldier, probably fought in the Battle of Ridgefield and the Battle of White Plains, but he also was um, uh, captured and was a prisoner, served uh, his, his uh, prison terms down in, in Brooklyn on a prison ship. And while he was there, since he also not only was he a farmer, he was a tailor. And the story goes, the family story goes, is that while he was a prisoner, he got his job was to uh, repair and make uniform for the British soldiers. Now, this is a map of 1858. Uh, if you've been to these other sessions, we've I've shown parts of this map each time. But just to acquaint uh, us with some of the names you're going to be hearing, well, right here is the is the Cross River coming down. Uh, this this is Boutonville, which is actually we like to claim it as part of our town. It's really Pound Ridge, one of the hamlets of Pound Ridge, but it's it's right at the back end of the reservation. So the Cross River would be going um, the boundaries of the reservation. Uh, this, by the way, is Boutonville Road nowadays, or Reservation Road, which came all the way straight through to where 121 is today. But here's the Cross River as it heads its way to Katona. But you'll see there are a lot of Meads, there are Todd's again, Benedict's, Lawrence's, uh, we're gonna hear more about when we get to South Salem, but Reynolds, George Reynolds, 
hunt the store over here, which we'll see it on another map. This was William Hunt's store and William Hunt's house next door to it. We're going to see pictures of that and that store when the reservoir, when the reservoir, uh, when this land was all declared uh, property of New York City, a lot of these places disappeared. And one of them was the Hunt store, but it didn't totally disappear because some of the, uh, the wood in the Hunt store was used to build the fifth division. Um, now we'll go to, uh, even though this picture set was taken in 1904, it's the Cross River Baptist Church. And this church was organized by the Reynolds family, Nathaniel, and was one of the organizers in 1789. So it's still fitting into the 18th century. Uh, and the only part that doesn't fit into the 18th century is the, uh, the 1800s edition of the steeple, the bell tower, and this vestibule. Before that, it was about 10 feet shorter. But the church was organized in 1789, and the church was uh, that was, was organized in Reynolds' homes. But um, when it finally got built, it, the first use of the building was 1781. I'm, I'm sorry, 1791. So it is the oldest uh, public building still standing in our town. Unfortunately, it's one of the congregations that has just suffered from time. Now we're going into the 1820s. This is the brick, the brick mansion, as anybody who travels down 121 probably knows it, loves it, and calls it. Uh, it was a Reynolds property built by uh, Gideon Reynolds in 1829. Gideon Reynolds ran a uh, postal stagecoach from uh, I went from New York to White Plains to Cross River and then on up to Danbury. He used about 49 horses apparently in his stage run. But built this beautiful house and um, uh, it also served as, as a, uh, an inn for people who had to spend the night who had come up from the bowels of New York to, uh, to on their way to, to Danbury. And in the cellar was a tavern, and that tavern, um, years ago, I interviewed Zeke Hunter, who ran the bait shop uh, in Cross River until he passed away. And uh, Zeke said it was still a tavern, not, and not, not too long ago, into the early 1940s, I think. It still was serving as, as a tavern. Here's another picture of it, and this is a postcard, actually. Um, it's a very lovely house. It does not have the veranda on it anymore, but uh, note the sign, special today, dinner, $1. And I think that might be from the early 1900s. This is a picture of the, the back parlor of the brick, the brick house. Um, you saw the quilt patch earlier on. This is called a Lindsay Woolsey, uh, a very intricate weaving pattern that uh, if you know what a jacquard weave is, the back is the exact opposite of what we're seeing today. And this jacquard woven Lindsay Woolsey was made at the, at the brick house by somebody in the Reynolds family. It's again part of the quilt collection that the Reynolds, that the Russell family gave to the town because the Russells are Reynolds back when. And it's huge. It's probably would fit a, a, a king size bed today, but it's an amazing, a beautiful piece of wool. It's, it's all wool. Well, I guess we're lucky that the fourth R never came to town because two railroads made, um, uh, tries at having a railroad come through Cross River. We might have been the Kansas City of New York State if all these railroads during the 1870s came to fruition. But this happens to be a, uh, uh, some, a stock certificate for the New York Housatonic and Northern Railroad Company, which even though the farmers were looking forward to a railroad and a lot of them bought stock, bought shares in the companies, 
there was there was a rather um, financial panic back in the late 1870s and, and following. And most of these railroad companies never got too far north of White Plains. Uh, there are lots of very interesting books that you can get out of the library about uh, the history of the railroads in, um, in Westchester. And these, the two railroads that were, um, that were proposed to come through Cross River would then have continued kind of following along over toward Mead Street, up over Holly Mountain and on toward uh, Danbury and points north. So it would have totally destroyed what we know of as our town is today. This is the other church in Cross River. This is the Methodist Episcopal Church. And this is a picture of the church when it was uh, still across, uh, it had to be moved when the reservoir came. And this would have been on the uh, west side of what's now 121 down in the reservoir facing east. Notice the architecture of this building. This picture was taken prior to eight to 1906 because 1905 and 1906, they were condemning all the properties because they were starting to build the dam a little further toward Katona and uh, uh, they had to move a, a bunch of buildings and uh, homes. And one of them was this church. The, the other church that I showed you did not need to be moved because it was on its nice little hill. But notice in this picture, we have two doorways and a middle portion, which is some sort of a louvered, louvered arrangement here. Now we're gonna to go to when it was moved across the street. And it looks like those two doors were made into windows. And that center spot is how it is today. Uh, with a center door. If you are wondering where this is, it's next to the brick house. It's, it's just west of the brick house. It's for a long time, it was owned by that same property as the brick house. I don't know who owns it now, but it's had several iterations, um, a hippie pad, uh, a, uh, an art gallery. And uh, actually, I don't know what what its status is right now, but um, it was in disrepair for a long time, and it's uh, it, it's not a hasn't been a church for almost a hundred years. Now we have a map of Cross River. Originally, this map was drawn by Cyrus Russell back in uh, probably the fifties, and when the the big blue history book was published, Carol Barrett, who was very artistic, took Cyrus Russell's sketch and turned it into the map that you can find in the Big Blue History Book. Here we find a lot of the same names that we saw in that 1858 map. Things move slowly in Cross River. Uh, we're going to see a picture of Hunt's Mill. This is George Hunt's Mill. We're going to see pictures of the Hunt, uh, the Hunt store, the Hunt house. Uh, we are going to see, we've already seen the church and the Methodist church, which was moved in 1906. We're gonna see William Moore's house. We're going to see the Whitman house. Uh, we're gonna see Frank Reynolds. We're gonna see all these houses right here in a picture that was taken shortly before the reservoir took over. Uh, and here is Old Shop Road going up toward Katona and this is uh, what we would call Route 35, but back when they were, uh, they were so excited to have the railroads coming through that on some old maps, you'll see this part of what's now Route 35 called Railroad Avenue. Here's the Indian River coming in to meet the Cross River. And this is going out towards South, South Salem, and this would be 121 going up past the high school. So, um, Maybe later on, we'll have to come back to this, but um, this is Cross River as of the turn of the 20th century. Love this picture. It's the um, George Avery's mill. Looks like it's probably a lumber mill, although there were cider mills and lumber mills and grist mills throughout the area. 
uh, from Boutonville into Cross River. And uh, this picture was situated, that mill apparently was situated behind this ramshackle ruin of the George Avery store. Uh, this picture was again taken in 1904. This is Route 35, we'll call it going towards South Salem up the hill. Um, right in here would be Fifth Division Market nowadays. Over here, we're looking at somewhere the Ambulance Corps uh, building, the Bailey Fountain, probably in this area, and then 121, what's now 121, heading off south. George Avery decided he didn't want to pay his taxes. Um, and this, we're talking going back to like the late 1850s, early 1860s, back to the time when Abe Lincoln was elected president. And one of the stories is that George Avery did not like the politics of Abraham Lincoln. So he said he wasn't going to pay any more taxes. And he didn't. And he just let the store uh, fall apart. Uh, the other story goes that, well, he loved his wife a lot. His wife passed away. And when his wife passed away, he just didn't have the heart to continue uh, with his general store. And so he left it, moved to Norwalk or someplace, and it fell to rack in the room. Eventually, he did come back to town uh, with another wife, but um, we don't know the real story. Was it because he didn't like Abraham Lincoln's politics or because he just was so saddened by the loss of someone he did like? Uh, I, I don't know whether it was Waldy Gullen or Carl Madsen or Bud Adams. One of my history go-to guys told me that as, um, as youngsters, that store was still there and they could go into the basement and he, they said there was still corsets hanging or maybe it's just something, I maybe it's before those gentlemen's time. But, and I just read it in an article, but there were still Civil War era dresses and corsets and, and hoop skirts and, uh, and uh, toys in that the basement of that store. So uh, it was kind of a Mrs. Haversham, great expectations, just leave. Uh, Hull's Market, Hull's Meat Market with the horse and buggy, circa, probably circa 1900 because horses and buggy, there weren't that many cars until the mid teens, 19, 10, 15, something like that. Uh, everybody went wherever they had to go, either by Shanks mare or the mare pulling the buggy. This is the John Hunt uh, home. And I imagine those are Hunt people sitting out front. And as you can see, it it is, actually attached to the Hunt General Store. And we'll see a picture of this coming up. But this would have been reorient yourself to the side of the road where the Ambulance Corps building is now on that corner between where 121 goes south and Route 35 heads east in that Ambulance Corps era, area. Here's a picture of the Hunt store from the front. This is Mr. Hunt standing here. He's talking to the guys. And um, this is kind of fun. Here's a gentleman sitting here. And here are four boys just shooting the time of day. I don't guess they're playing marbles, but uh, they certainly are having a pretty cool conversation. And I just had to throw in one more picture because it's a slightly different scene of the Hunt store. You can see the house that's next to it. And um, some remedy is up here. Here is a um, uh, buggy with some, uh, I don't know what that buggy says. Somebody's bakers though. And uh, the front porch of the store and somebody on a, on a great looking bicycle. Again, early, I would say early 1900s. Now, have to reorient yourselves again. We are right here, standing on um, Reservation Road, going into the res. We'd be heading, if we go this way, we're heading east. Here is 
the Cross River. And when Dana and I were looking at these pictures the other day, she said, rivers, not that, doesn't look that big nowadays. So you'll see why it's that big in a minute. But imagine over here, the Ambulance Corps building and uh, the schoolhouse just up here a ways, the Cyrus Russell Community House, which was a schoolhouse. But we are looking from George um, Hunt's lumber mill, sawmill, across into downtown uh, Cross River. Quite a, uh, quite a happening place. Lots of buildings, lots of homes. And this would be looking kind of so, uh, toward um, what is now Route 35. Just imagine you're on Reservation Road going into the res, and this would be what you would be going past at the, at the beginning of the road. There's the dam. And that dam was holding back some of the water for the mill. And it used to be, and it probably still is, if the water is down really low and you are um, want to take a walk back behind the ambulance corps, you might see you wouldn't see the higher the high structure, but you might see the stone walls and some of the foundation for that mill um, for the mill race and the dam. Here's here's what we just looked at. Here is the sawmill. Here is the town, and here is the river. This is a street. Um, the caption is before the flood. And I don't know who this is standing here, but this was the Pullen Meat Market. This was Augustus Pullen's house. Um, I'm not sure whose house this was, but this was Frank uh, Reynolds' house. And the only reason I'm mentioning Frank Reynolds is because we're going to see his. Oh, and this this is all underwater now. This is all. This is all gone. Here we are. Here's that Frank Reynolds house. And here's the Frank Reynolds family. And these are the other house. This would have been the meat market house and the house in between. This is the bridge over uh, the Cross River before it was, this road obviously had to be moved. It's now 121. But this was all inundated when the floods came. Here we're looking at uh, Ed Harris's blacksmith shop. Here's Old Shop Road going up toward Katona. And as I mentioned before, not Route 35, but Railroad Avenue going on up the hill toward Katona. I love this picture because um, this, is, this is somebody I love. And there's also a little, a little child following the wagon. I'm not sure if they're cows or oxen. Uh, they've got a big yoke, but I'm not that much an animal husband person to know what they what they are. But uh, this is the meadows in 1981. Part of this area would have been the meadows. This is going on. Uh, this is Route 35 nowadays, and this gentleman is is out. It might be a silkman because the silkman had a big farm. Uh, we're big farmers in Cross River as well as Golden's Bridge. I love this look of Route 35 and what it used to be. Another look at Route 35, and this is probably around night after 1910, because that's when the telephone came to town. This is the Reynolds Homestead, which is still there. It's a beautiful gambrel roofed house built in the late 1700s. Uh, again, Nathaniel Reynolds, this is probably built by one of his, one of his cousins. This is James Reynolds. And um, this is the way into South Salem. So you kind of picture yourself uh, as to where the, <clears throat> the uh, Reynolds homestead is. And then over here again, just up the road a ways, we would be, well, actually, all, all over in here would be the meadows nowadays. Here's this, what's now the Cyrus Russell Community House, but back in 1900 or maybe the 1890s, this was the uh, Cross River One Room Schoolhouse. Luckily, uh, well, I think this was probably built after the reservoir. Uh, this was not a building that was moved <clears throat> when the waters came to the reservoir, but quite a big, uh, 
must be their annual picture day. And uh, it's quite a, quite a bunch of ch children for that school. A lot of farmers because the whole area was farming. And then the blacksmiths and the, the sawmill workers and the other ancillary crafts that you need. Um, I know we have uh, a Cross River person listening and Tony Townsend told me in an email that uh, he remembers back in the 60s coming or the late 50s at some point in his childhood coming to Christmas community sings at, at the uh, community house and there was a, a tall pine tree out front that would be the town Christmas tree. It was all lit up. Okay, this is a postcard view of Cross River. Whoever sent it said, I am living in this section, Eddie. Uh, you'll see the name C.A. Miller, who we're gonna hear of in a little bit, not too many cards down the road, uh, pictures down the road. But I think I have in my notes, it's looking Northwest. Um, so I think we're standing uh, on, reservation side of things. Uh, and I forgot to recheck with my husband because he's more geographically inclined than I am. But you can see the openness of the land. You can see the, uh, the water coming in here. Uh, and uh, just what it would have looked like uh, if, if, if uh, Chapman Miller took this picture, it was in about, it was about 1910. Uh, here we go to the dam. The dam uh, was proposed around uh, the early, the first five years of the turn of the century, about 1995. They started condemning the land and construction was begun uh, in 1905. This picture is from 1907. This shows all the cranes. Uh, there was also, and I did not use a picture. I didn't have a good picture of it, but there was a railroad, a little Toonerville kind of trolley that was built from the Katona Depot out to the dam. And it was on trestles so that it was, I don't think this is it here. I think it was kind of behind this picture, but it came, it was, it was as high as the height of the dam and it came bringing stones and concrete. It came bringing the building materials for the, for the dam. And it was such a contraption that it tended to fall off the tracks every now and then. And it was called the Bowtonville Express and created a lot of amusement for the local, the local people. Uh, a lot of people came to work on the dam. There were over 200 Italian uh, stone workers, and they lived in a shanty town up near Mount Holly, the Mount Holly area, also over by the railroad. And uh, uh, there was a bit of trouble. In fact, there were some mafias. The mafia came in at one point. There were some murders. It kept the sheriff busy, so the sheriff set up a deputy post out in the Mount Holly area to uh, try to keep some peace, and then. Also, four to 500, as the Katona Times said, four to 500 colored people were about, were scheduled to arrive from the South to work on the dam. And they also came with, uh, with mules to help uh, with the work. So we had people imported from the South and people imported from Italy to work on this dam. It was all being done by the New York water, water uh, organization. Here's a picture. Maybe you can orient yourself. We're almost we're down by Katona. This is where they've just built that huge new uh, water processing plant. This is, here's the dam. And uh, here is uh, some of the countryside, but uh, here is basically seeing the dam through the fog. But this is, this is Route 35 before you get to the reservoir. Here's a picture of the reservoir in 1908, or about 1908. It's, it's basically done. They're gonna start letting, I think actually the dam was 
uh, finished between 1907 and 1908, and they started letting the water in. This postcard of the spillway from the dam, all up and running, looking, looking just fine. Except apparently in 1955, we had a very um, strong hurricane in the Northeast and it, it took out some of the uh, lower equipment from the, uh, took out the water, the water pump part of the dam. And here's a picture from 1910, view of the Cross River Dam with a car coming across. And here's a picture of the reservoir, again, published by Chapman Miller. So it's probably around uh, 1910 of that era. The, um, the little, a little information on the dam is 170 feet tall, 840 feet long, and it holds back 11 billion gallons of water and it costs 777.7 thousand dollars, seven hundred seventy-seven point seven thousand dollars. Now we're going to come, uh, we're getting a little long here in the 20th century. This is Pearson, uh, Pierce Bailey. Pierce Bailey was the builder along with his wife of the Four Winds, the Four Winds Estate. Pierce Bailey was uh, born in 1865 and he died in 1922. He did not have that long a life, but in that time he was a psychiatrist and he was responsible. He served in World War I uh, as his, as uh, kind of an, um, an expert for the army. And he was responsible for developing the uh, intelligence tests that they would give the army recruits to decide if they were they were uh, healthy enough to serve to serve the country. Uh, they lived in the city, but then around 1900, a little after 1900, they built Four Winds. And uh, here is a picture of his wife, Edith. So Pierce and Edith Bailey, at first it was a summer home, but then I think about 1905, they decided they'd live up here permanently and it was, a home, a very gracious home uh, with a lot of picnics, a lot of celebrations. Uh, they had four children, two of whom were twins. But unfortunately, uh, Edith had severe diabetes. And uh, uh, even though she died young, she died, she died in 1912 and she was only 42, but she was a suffragette. Uh, she was a poet, she was a writer, and um, uh, she spent a lot of her energies, even though she was not the healthiest person, spent a lot of her energies in the suffragette, the early suffragette movement, and uh, gave speeches in New York City and went on marches, and she would hold uh, fundraisers and galas at the home in Cross River, which we will see momentarily. This is, these are some pictures uh, from Four Winds. Uh, a couple of these were taken in 1934, and this is the entrance, the main entrance to the house. This is uh, the lodge gardens and looking at the main house. And from reading newspaper um, clippings from that era, uh, and information reading about Mrs. Uh, Bailey, I believe she would hold her galas and her, her picnics and uh, her uh, celebrations probably in, in this garden area. Her husband, well, the, ba the Baileys owned property on both sides of uh, what's now Route 35. So uh, there was a, a spring, actually there, I think there was a spring in that uh, Pierce Bailey was able to capture, and I believe he, by gravity feed, he had the water come down the mountain and uh, across the reservoir or under the whatever, and come up at this fountain. And the fountain was built in 1910, and he then had a, he had it dedicated to his wife when she passed away in 1912. This was a horse watering trough. Uh, 
which uh, was always filled for travelers. And also, I'll show you a picture of what it is nowadays. It's right at the corner of, one th of 35 and 121. And I'm going to read you the uh, inscription. And then if uh, Tony Townsend is around, I want him to just say a few, a few words. But the, fount the uh, fountain inscription is, spirits of water, earth and sky, all gather here where once dwelt one who like this spring was sparkling sweet and clear. And Tony, I don't know if you can unmute yourself. Would you like to say something? Yeah, I spent a large portion of my uh, of youth hanging out on the fountain, Maureen. It was it was great. Um, there was a sign above the fountain on a tree that said Ward Poundridge Reservation had an arrow. And invariably, at least once every time we sat there, a car would pull up and, and we're sitting right under the sign and they would say, you know what, they know which way Ward Poundridge Reservation is? And we'd all <laughs> chuckle and just point down the road. But uh, yeah, we'd, we'd go over to the fifth division and get sandwiches and drinks and then go sit on the fountain and watch the cars go by. Great way to spend your youth. It sounds like it, it did you well, it <laughs> did you well. Kept you out of trouble sometimes, I guess. Yeah, that's right. If you have any other stories, feel free to, to pop in. Uh, and I hope you didn't mind me sh showing your your parents' gravesite because I really love their epitaph. Not at all. That's yeah, you probably know that's the title of his autobiography. I, yeah, uh, I think I think I remember that now that you say it. But your dad needs a, a, a show all of his own, so we won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> and probably you do too. But I just met you, so I don't know. Okay, we will travel on to. Uh, We'll go back from right now at the fountain back to 1921. And these are two new Dodge trucks that were sold to William Whitman, another cross, cross, uh, cross River family that has lived there for a couple of centuries. And they're cutting ice, uh, which was a very necessary chore every winter. And luckily the winters were hard enough and cold enough that ice formed on on the reservoir and uh, you could get your trucks out on, on the ice and, and cut it. I don't know about this operation, but I do know in Golden's Bridge and I'm sure they did it here, whether they were still doing it in 1920 and 21, probably not. But uh, first they would use horses to pull the equipment out on the ice and do the cutting. And uh, you had to be careful that you didn't lose a horse. Uh, I just thought actually this picture, and I'm not sure <clears throat> which way it's looking, but here uh, are the number of dwellings up on the hillside. And I just thought I'd show the other picture that goes with it because here are the men uh, getting that ice up on blocks and getting it into the trucks. But this time uh, I think we're looking, might be looking in a slightly different direction. But the major industry whenever uh, winter arrived in Cross River. Just the scene, uh, roads, the new, the new bridge after they put in the reservoir and we're heading, well, the cars are heading, heading uh, up north, but this is south on into uh, going down toward Bedford and Pound Ridge. Uh, another thing of uh, going along about 10 years later, early 1930s, this is a picture of the CCC encampment in Poundridge Reservation. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the CCC was, it was part of uh, FDR's uh, program, one of his programs, WPA programs, to put people back to work. And uh, this, it's the Civilian Conservation Corps, or as it's known as Roosevelt's Tree Boys. When they came, uh, one of their one of their uh, uh, duties or, or jobs all across the country, the CCC had um, establishments or installations all across the country, not only here in New York State, but um, even um, when we were visiting Hawaii not too many years ago, the, at Volcanoes National Park, the CCC had built a shelter and the CCC had done restoration work and other kinds of work in Hawaii. And we've been down on the on the uh, the uh, uh, Blue Ridge Highway. They were there, helping to build that. 
and uh, uh, anywhere you go, you might run into the uh, the uh, re what the CCC did in Pounder's Reservation. They uh, it was just after the elm and the chestnut blights had struck um, the United States, the Dutch elm disease. So there were a lot of dead trees in the reservation and the CCC job starting in about 1930, 33, it was, this was one of the earliest camps and it lasted until about 1941, early 42. The job of the CCC boys here was to clean up the detritus from the, the elm and the chestnuts and then to replant and they planted a lot of white pine which you used to see as you drove in Reservation Road until we had that major blowdown about 15 years ago and the majority of the trees not only at the at the entrance road but throughout the park that had been planted by the CCC uh, were blown down and then the res reservation has started a replanting program but if you are at all a visitor to the reservation, right now I'd like you to envision Michigan Road. The end of the Michigan Road uh, parking lot would have been all clear because this, this camp was about a um, quarter of a mile in the, up the trail. Uh, and uh, a Boy Scout, several Scouts have done a wonderful job of putting uh, some history into where the CCC camp was. Um, as you go up Michigan Road, before you get to the parking area, there is a little lake or a pond on the side. That was their swimming hole. Uh, they had made that quite a bit larger and that's where the boys, uh, the men, would, would get their swimming in, in the summertime. To be eligible for the CCC, you had to come from a family that was, um, on welfare or in need of welfare, between uh, men between the ages of 18 and 25 could apply um, for the Civilian Conservation Corps. They received, uh, I believe, $30 a month, five they could keep, 25 had to be sent home to their family. Um, or it was $25, they kept they kept five and 20 went home to the family. I forget, but there's a $25 in there somewhere. And uh, uh, you could sign up. I believe your enlistment period was for two years. Uh, some, some kids, some guys signed up for more than two years, but by the early 19, by 1941, when, the, when our country entered World War II, a lot of the, these uh, fellows who had joined the CCC segued into the armed services. And so the camp was abandoned in the early 1940s. If you ever are at the res, I, uh, it's one of the really more, well, the trails are all great, but it, it's a very, if you wanna get a look at history, uh, 80 years ago, take a, take a look at the CCC trail. Oh, and the boys would come into town and go to the, down to the, uh, the market. Uh, and they'd go to the, they'd have uh, dances and Halloween parties at the, uh, the Baptist church. And speaking of going into town, where else would you go but Fifth Division Market? Uh, as I said before, and this is uh, probably in the 1940s, early 40s, late 30s. Um, part of the market were built from the Hunt Market, which had been across the way, taken by the reservoir. So uh, it carried on. It was run by uh, Hunt, the Hunt family for a while. And then uh, when Anthony Felice came back from World War I, he bought the business, took it over and named it for his uh, division in World War I, his, his army division. So that's where the fifth division comes from. And then in 1949, uh, Anthony's son, Ralph, and Waldy Gullen, who were high school buddies, bought the business from, uh, from Ralph's father and took it over and ran it, uh, ran it for the next uh, 40, about 40 years, 30, 40 years. Uh, and here they are playing cards because they had nothing else to do because um, about, well, 
in the late 1940s, I guess, a blue law came in which said that positively no meats could be sold on Sunday. They were really against this because most of their business, and Tony kind of mentioned going over there for a sandwich, uh, people going after Tony and his friends pointed into the reservation, they needed something to eat. So they wanted a picnic, they could come back and uh, the fifth division got a lot of business from the, uh, the Sunday and Saturday travelers who came up to the country for the day. However, they could sell anything else, but they could not sell meat because somebody in another market complained. Eventually, uh, the blue law disappeared and uh, the market went back to as we know it today. There's another market on uh, that was in downtown Cross River. It's still there today. And those of you with an eye to the future can see that it's the bait shop and the, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it? The, the lawnmower and uh, tractor and, and electric motor repair shop. But back then it was owned, uh, it was Joe and Hazel Adams General Store. And uh, uh, again, a good place for the kids to go buy, buy uh, I guess probably penny ice cream, ice cream, uh, little toys, anything that uh, a general store might have. Uh, eventually it segued um, into Joe, Joe and Hazel kind of got out of the business. <clears throat> And it was bought, it was turned over. I guess it was always owned by uh, Waldy Gullen. I'm not, I think Waldy had a, a hand in this one too. But um, uh, it became the bait shop. Zeke Hunter ran the bait shop until his death <coughs> in the middle or early 2000s. And uh, served all the fish, one of the few, the other bait shop was way over by Whitehall Corner. So uh, if you wanted to go fishing in the reservoir, you needed bait. So uh, the bait shop was the place to go. Another place to go, which it was, at the in was at the intersection of, uh, of Route 121 and 35, which we all know and love today as the Shell Station, which was uh, built in 1968 uh, after Koch's log cabin had burned down a number of years before that and was just uh, kind of a derelict corner known as Dibble's, Dibble's Corner. But when Koch's log cabin was here, good German cooking, dancing, there was a dance hall in there, there were refreshments. Uh, it was a, a popular place for locals. It was also a popular place for the hunters who would come up, up to Northern Westchester uh, on the weekends to hunt and the regulars, whether they were the, hunter, the, the hunters coming by for the weekend or the guys that came by every day, apparently behind the, the, the counter in the log cabin was a big pegboard and everybody had their own mug on the peg. So they were ready to go when they got there. And judging from the cars, it's the 1930s. We thought, when I first looked, they look like wolves or coyotes, but I think they're just friendly dogs. But in 1968, it became the Shell Station. And at some point, and I couldn't find it, I think about 1971, the, traf the first traffic light in Lewisboro was installed right at that corner. Uh, here's a picture that I had totally forgotten about this name. Siemens restaurant, which uh, is now, it, which became Valenti's restaurant. It's uh, right on Route 35. This is obviously, it looks like the early 50s. Uh, the the uh, Sal Sunoco is right on the other side of these bushes. And this, this building is still here. Uh, it's, it was a restaurant until uh, tragedy struck the family. <clears throat> Uh, there were there were a couple. There was an automobile accident which killed the owners, and according to people I've talked to, who lived in Cross River about that time, uh, the restaurant just shut its doors. Another place that just shut its doors, and if you were able to look through the windows today, you would still see the tables set 
and the glasses on the table, waiting for the next, another great expectations story. But it is now, it is, its last iteration was Valenti's, but here's a wonderful wedding happening in the early 1950s. Here we have Chapman Miller, the man I mentioned before, who, uh, who was the postmaster. He started as, uh, I think, a 19-year-old. He was postmaster for 47 years. And when he retired, his daughter, Ruth Rohner, took over as postmistress. Now, this was the original, well, when the post office, Chapman first ran the post office in the Hunt store, but then uh, he opened up next to his house. Uh, this would have been Chapman's house right next door here. He opened his own, a, a separate post office. And uh, in that post office, well, the postmaster did not make a lot of money. Basically, his money, what his salary was predicated on was how many stamps he sold and how many packages he had to, uh, he had to sell postage for. Wasn't, you didn't make a lot of money being the postmaster. So he, he also had a bakery and he had homemade bread and rolls. I have an incredible stretch of diaries from his first diary back in about 1901 when he was a young boy still in school until the um, 1940s or 1950s talking about what Cross River, how he saw Cross River. He, it was a daily diary for all those years. And he just, in reading the diary, you get a good idea of how the first four decades of Cross River went, how from no cars, uh, from horse and buggies to no cars, except a few on Sunday, to uh, a lot of traffic accidents at the corner of 121 and, and 35. He was in this uh, this building until, uh, and remember the name Chapman Miller because it's gonna come up again. Uh, in nine, in uh, 1964, uh, a new post office was built, but this is how you would recognize the post office today in Yellow Monkey Village. And Yellow Monkey Village um, was started, let me see if I can, find it on my, on my notes. Yeah, about 1975, Yellow Monkey Village was developed by Lee Hardesty who ran the Yellow Monkey Antiques. And his, his goal or his scope of operations was to move a lot of the original buildings in Cross River into what is now the young Yellow Monkey Village. And this happened to be uh, Chapman's post office. And this is where the post office moved in 1964, which you might recognize today as um, the Cross River Wine and Spirits. But it was started as a real estate uh, building built by, real, by Robert Corey as a real estate building. Then in 1964, it became the Cross River Post Office. And it was here, and Ruth Rohner was the postmistress here. Uh, I don't have a date for her retirement, but... Um, in 1970, uh, when, the, when the Cross River Shopping Center was built, uh, the post office was moved into the shopping center and that's where it's been built today. So, all right, back to the cemetery, just for a little a story, a very sad story. Uh, Cyrus, us uh, Chapman and his wife Laura had a baby named Laura Elizabeth, it was the first child. Uh, and she was born July 20th, 1924. She died just a scant two years later on August 12th in 1926. Uh, Mrs. Miller was doing laundry. And to do laundry back in those days, you would fill a, a tub of scalding water and you would do your laundry in the water, the, the hot water, and then wring it out and then you would hang it up. Well, somehow the toddler fell into the tub and was scalded and drowned and died. And uh, this is her tombstone up, up in the cemetery. It suffered a little bit of um, 
of uh, damage. I don't think it's vandalism, it's just age. But that was a very, a very sad ending to this little girl's life. Uh, they went on and had two other daughters, uh, Ruth, of, Ruth being uh, the one who took over her dad's job as post, postmistress. Uh, we're going to segue now to the Reynolds family. This is the Reynolds family homestead. Uh, notice the gambrel roof. It was built around 1780, I believe. And it's still sitting there on the, uh, the south side of Route, of Route 35. But it was the home of this lady. This is Lois Reynolds. She was born in 1919. She graduated from in that house, actually. And um, when Lois told me she was born in that house, I said, well, were you born in the boarding room? And she said, no, I was born in the front room. I said, well, why weren't you born in the boarding room? She said, well, I guess they didn't know what was happening. Anyway, uh, Lois survived that birth, even though it wasn't in the boarding room. She uh, graduated from Katona High School in 1937. She worked for all of, basically all of her working life. She worked for Conrail up in Buffalo, up in that huge uh, complex that uh, uh, the New York Central Conrail throughout their iterations of names uh, were. And then in she, when she retired in 1984, she came back to Cross River and immediately became what she always has. She was always used to doing work and being busy. She and her sister Joyce were the mainstays of the uh, Cross River Baptist Church because their, their ancestors had, had started it. And uh, when Joyce passed away in 2015, uh, it was a very sad day. The sisters lived together in the house their father had built for them next, just east of the, uh, the homestead. Uh, and here is, well, not today, but last, last uh, during the pandemic, Lois turned, uh, let me see, I'll put her back. Lois turned 101. And uh, with Dana's help, the town sent more than Oh, I think it was a hundred. Dana's idea, let's get 101 birthday cards for Lois to celebrate her birthday. The town, the response was overwhelming. And uh, uh, we did not have enough room on that bulletin board for me to attach all of the, all of the Christmas, all of the birthday greetings <clears throat> that Lois got. Um, Lois was active in everything. She was active in the Girl Scouts when she was up in Buffalo. And when she came back here, she joined the senior citizens and she was here barely a year when they said, wouldn't you like to be president? Well, I don't know. Anyway, she was president and she was one of the um, first people sworn in or inducted into the uh, Westchester County Senior Citizens Hall of Fame. But here is Lois last May 31st at her birthday celebration. And back then um, the South Salem Fire Department <clears throat> as well as the other fire departments in town were kind enough to do drive-by birthday hellos. And so uh, uh, it, this happened, the, the fire department said, oh, for Lois, we'd be really happy to do it. And uh, the ambulance corps had some of their equipment in it. The state police had their equipment, had a couple of state police cars, um, all of the town police. It was a huge uh, parade down Route 35 past Lois's house and on, on back to their respective uh, homes. But it was the last parade that they did during the pandemic for the birthdays. And it was by any means we think the best and so was the town outpouring of, of uh, respect and warm wishes for Lois on her 101st birthday and right now she's looking forward to her 102nd this May so we wish Lois well and uh, she's one of my very very favorite people when I asked her uh, how do you how do you account for this long life and and what's your philosophy and you can see it in the way she's lived her life and in her attitude today. And she is still smart as a whip. And I think it's because of her attitude that just keep going, don't stop. Keep up with your friends, keep in touch with them. And uh, 
just enjoy every day as it comes. And believe me, that's what Lois is still doing. Can't get around as she could used to, but uh, she is, she's like the Energizer Bunny, God bless her. All right, now Cyrus Russell. Cyrus Russell was known as Mr. Lewis Bro at one point in well before, uh, before he died. And uh, uh, he was born about the well, 1840s, 1890s. And uh, he, he uh, in 1941, the, or the, uh, the Westchester Defense Volunteers, kind of the civil defense in Lewisboro, was a really gung-ho organization. Many, many, many townsfolk from all over town signed up to be volunteers. Should there be some sort of disaster in town, they would be willing to help uh, to do any kind of, of uh, driving if they had a car or making bandages or uh, going on patrol to make sure people had their lights blackout during a blackout drill, that their shades were drawn, their blackout shades, uh, so that the enemy air force, enemy airplanes going over would not shoot down anybody in Lewisboro. So they all filled out these cards. And I must have close to a hundred of them, <coughs> excuse me, in my office. And they are awesome because they have everybody's vital, vital statistics. A lot of them, thank goodness, have these headshots of what, of, of what that person looked like in 1940-41. This is Cyrus, Cyrus Russell. Uh, and what they did was fingerprint everybody. So not only do we know um, what Cyrus looked like and how much he weighed and if he wore glasses and what he'd be willing to, on the back of the card, it said what you'd be willing to do in an emergency. Well, Cyrus Russell was always ready for an emergency too. Um, he was a carpenter. He worked for the CCC. Uh, he actually worked, I think he worked in the Poundridge site building it. And then he, I know he traveled up upstate to, uh, the middle of the state also to supervise some uh, CCC buildings going up there. He was the town clerk starting in uh, uh, about 1924. And he was the building inspector. And then he went from being town clerk to going to the town board. And he ended up as town supervisor in 1961 and he <clears throat> retired in 1971. Unfortunately, he did pass away in 19, uh, retired in 1969 and he passed away in 1971. Uh, but during Cyrus Russell's tenure in politics in town, there were some big changes. And I just wanna read something I wrote about him uh, a while ago. And uh, I'm sure you all will be interested to know that the first zoning ordinance was passed and the zoning map in, in May of 1936. This made a need for a building inspector and building permits. So three guesses who became the town's first building inspector. No contest, it was Cyrus Russell. The job was part-time, but still the hours were long and often crazy. Inspector Russell spent hours riding around the back roads, listening for construction sounds. Since most of the construction seemed to be happening on weekends by folks coming up from the city, he changed his work hours so that he could more easily issue his stop work orders, his building code violations, and his request for building plans. Remember, he had started life as a carpenter many years back. Many of the building plans were submitted in pencil, scribbled on odd sizes of pieces of paper. These primitive plans can still be found in the early building department files. Cyrus Russell retired, if you can say, from that job in 1950s. Well, one of uh, Cyrus Russell's, uh, probably what he'd be remembered most for by people that didn't really know the man was that he issued the marriage license for Marilyn Monroe and Arthur Miller. They came to his house because that's where his office was, uh, his, his town clerk office. And, uh, and Marilyn and Arthur, I guess, appeared at his house on 121 
in Cross River and were granted their marriage license. They were later married, well, I don't know what the same day or whether it was uh, 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 next day, but they were married on Arthur Miller's uh, uh, agent's house in, in Wakabak. Somebody I saw online, somebody said they were married at the town hall. No, they were not married at the town hall. They did not get their license at the town hall. Uh, they got their license at Cyrus Russell's house and they were married <clears throat> in Wakabak. So Cyrus Russell uh, was, was quite a gentleman and uh, kind of like he, his mother was a Reynolds and that's how he's related to the Reynolds. He was born in the Gideon Reynolds brick house. So the Reynolds, the Moores, uh, maybe the Whitmans, the Russells, they're all, all related. There were so many cousins. By the way, I forgot to mention Nathaniel Reynolds at Civil at the Revolutionary War guy had 12 children. So you can see it started early. This is um, Evelyn Russell. She was the daughter of Cyrus and his wife, Hazel. She was his only daughter and they doted on her. And Evelyn doted or was loved her father. She loved her mother, but her father, I think, was her sweetheart. Uh, Evelyn was born in 1933, and unfortunately, she passed away a victim of COVID uh, this winter. So uh, this is a picture when, during the time that I had the quilt show, we had the quilt show uh, at the uh, ba Baptist Church, and this is a picture of Evelyn at her beloved organ in the Baptist Church, and these are the quilts that her family donated to the town. Uh, Evelyn loved to play the organ. Uh, she was full of vim and vigor for the organ. Uh, she even would, would go up with, uh, I think, Linda Yours, or maybe Pam Veith, with one of the uh, senior citizen uh, directors and play for the people up at Waterview Nursing Home, which then later, when she became unable to stay in her house, became her her home for the last several years of her life. But we will all miss Evelyn. Evelyn and her stories of her fantastic stories of the genealogy and the happenings of Cross River. We will miss Evelyn, but she lived, she lived a long life and she lived it uh, a lot of times in the service of others. Here are just some, some homes of people who lived in Cross River. This is the Frank Whitman home, which is on Boutonville Road going into the reservation. And the William Moore home. The Moores, as I said, were related to the, the Russells, the Reynolds, and uh, uh, I believe Alton Moore still lives in Cross River. Here's one of my favorite pictures. Never knew this lady, but the stories of this woman are, are uh, known by far and wide by people who grew up in the 50s or earlier, 30s, 40s in Cross River. This is Annie O'Neill. Annie O'Neill and her sister had a farm on 121 in Cross River going out just far. The farm was just before you get to Todd Road on the uh, west side of 121. They had that farm until the early 50s. They had, they had cattle, they had cows that, that actually I guess they were cows because Annie would drive the, uh, the cans of milk into the depot in Golden's Bridge so they could go off to be, to be uh, uh, pasteurized and, and, and processed. Uh, it was just run by Annie and her sister, although she did have help during this era, mainly the 30s uh, and probably the early 40s, the place, the uh, Cross River was known for the uh, gentlemen who would ride the rails, the hobos, and they would come to the farms looking for work. They would also look for handouts. Evelyn Russell talked about how they would come through the village and uh, her mother would give them something to eat. But Annie would give them uh, work and she would also give them something to eat. And according to one gentleman that I, uh, that I interviewed, uh, the talk was that there'd be more than cider in the, uh, 
in the stuff she gave them to drink. So they, they got their libation as well as uh, working for Annie O'Neill. This is unfortunately, the place just got too much for the sisters and uh, they, they, they were two rock'em sock'em ladies, I guess. And this house was uh, falling into rack and ruin. And in the <clears throat> sometime after the, the early 1950s, the South Salem Fire Department burned it in a drill. So if you were to walk up in that meadow, uh, you might still find the foundation. It, it's, um, it's still open land before you get to Todd Road. Uh, Lewis, uh, Lewisboro has almost 19 cemeteries. Uh, they're all listed in the big blue, well, some of them, most of them are listed in the big blue history book. This is Avery Cemetery, which is on the reservation. It's on Schoolhouse Road, which is the road that goes off to the right, just as you get up to the, uh, to the uh, toll station to go into the reservation. It's a very pleasant cemetery, uh, very old cemetery. Basically, uh, people who lived, the farms, the farmers and the farms that were on the reservation that's filled with, with uh, Avery's, it's called the Avery Cemetery. And it, it houses a lot of people that aren't necessarily Avery's, but they might be related. And uh, uh, you don't even have to go into the res. You can park out in the, uh, the parking lot before you get into the reservation, you walk up and enjoy the cemetery. But we're going to go visit the other, we're going to end up here. And uh, sorry, it's a little longer than I thought. I knew I had too many pictures. But this is the Cross River Cemetery. And uh, taken. this shot is taken from Route 35. And as you go up here, it, it morphs into the uh, Reynolds Cemetery. There are some revolutionary soldiers buried here. And there are a lot of Civil War soldiers buried here, as I mentioned earlier. But we're going to talk about this grave. This is the gravestone of Little Carrie. And Little Carrie was, um, well, this, this grave stands out. First of all, it's from a, um, it's, it's from a child and it says killed on it. Now I'm going to show you, uh, rubbing that we did of the grave killed at the uh, uh, at Cars Rock which is in Pennsylvania near Port Jervis in the Erie um, rail the, the Erie New York railroad disaster April 15th 1868 uh, Lil Perry was um, Uh, buried here in Cross River Cemetery, uh, but she's kind of a mystery. Now, that's the front, that's the stone again. This is the back of the stone. Uh, this, this stone was noticed first by somebody who had been uh, approached by a spirit, a little girl, probably around four years old, dressed in probably night clothes, very pretty little girl <clears throat> who, who approached a woman at her place of work at night peeked out from behind the door into the hallway and said, I'm not little Carrie, I'm Sarah, and I'm not buried in that cemetery. That was quite a shock to this woman. She, she does have paranormal uh, abilities and this spirit had picked her out to, to visit and to try to get this woman named MJ to help solve her problem. And her problem was that she's buried in that grave and her name is not Little Carrie. Well, if we look at the back of the grave, uh, well, when MJ and I visited the cemetery, um, we only knew about this little girl who did not want that name on her gravestone told this to some friends of mine who love, who are railroad buffs. And since it was a railroad disaster, I was telling them about this grave and this horrible train wreck. And so they went to take a picture and when they walked around behind the gravestone, 
there on the back was the inscription and it doesn't show up on the grave very well, but we took a rubbing. The only child of the Huell and Eliza Tisdale, um, aged four years, it looks like about 20 days, uh, two months and, or four months and a number of days. Well, that did it. Now I had something to go on so I could try to figure out, well, who's little Carrie? because there was no last name. And it turns out that with my research, Eliza, her mother was a Monroe who, whose parents lived in Cross River and this little Carrie was their daughter uh, who was buried in this, supposedly buried in this grave. Well, now let me tell you the story of um, the train wreck. We go back to the front of the grave. Uh, on the night of April 14th or 15th, there was, a, there was a train coming from Buffalo to New York City, and it was the Erie, Lack the Erie, the Erie Lackawanna Railroad. It was heading toward, uh, it was pretty close to its, to its journey's end. It was coming down near, uh, it had gone through Elmira, it had come down into the Port Jervis area. Pars Rock was the name of the Pennsylvania town where somehow something happened. A track was awry, three sleeping cars and one other car went off the tracks down an embankment <clears throat> Into the, into the river. Since it was, the sleeping cars were heated by wood burning stoves or coal burning stoves, whichever. The stoves were turned over, the cars, the sleeping cars caught fire and immediately 24 or 25 people were burned to death. Uh, the people who were saved, of the people that were saved from the, the wreck, uh, perhaps another 60 or 70 were were, uh, were were killed. That was a horrible, horrible train wreck. So bad that Cars Rock changed changed its name, and uh, it does not go by that anymore. So now you know there was a train wreck. There were several children killed in this train wreck. Probably two of them were little girls. One being Sarah. We don't know her last name. Who is the spirit? And one being little Carrie Mae Tisdale, who uh, was on the train coming from, <clears throat> uh, the parents lived in upstate New York and they probably got on the train around Elmira uh, or some, someplace before between Buffalo <clears throat> and Elmira and they were on the train. The mother survived, the daughter was killed. Uh, Obviously on this train, there was another little girl. Now, we'll go back to Sarah and her story. Sarah told MJ several times, I'm a child of war. I'm an orphan of war. You have got to help the children of war. You've got to help the orphans of war. There are a lot of us. And she, she told the story was, um, I came from down south and I went to my grandmother, but they were sending me back. Now, we wonder, were they, was the grandmother <clears throat> sending her back and she was alone or with a caretaker on this train when the train was derailed and caught on fire and she was killed? Because there are two other ghosts in this story. There's the little girl who is crying out for help. There is a woman who looks, who appears to be dressed in black, who has appeared in the same hallways where the little girl has appeared to MJ. And this woman is crying and <clears throat> crying and looking as if she is in mourning and very sad. There's also a third ghost, not as, as um, uh, pleasant a ghost. And Mary J, he's a rather rough character, kind of mean and, and uh, uh, not pleasant to deal with. Uh, and Mary J, just in her way of, of ESP, decided to name him John. When you go back to the story of the railroad disaster, you find a person named John Bowen. 
John Bowen was a disgruntled employee, ex-employee of the railroad. He was also, I guess, some sort of a drifter and a person who would uh, get into trouble and occasionally end up in jail. And as he was dying, and he was still incarcerated at this point for whatever, mis whatever he was in jail for, he said, I want to write a letter and I want to confess that I placed a spike and, and disrupted the rail on that rail line where the train went off the cliff. And this was maybe 10 years or so after the disaster had happened, but John felt he needed to get this off, off his chest. So was he the one that had caused the train wreck? We don't know. We don't know whether it's little Carrie in there or is Sarah's spirit the one that's right? Is she the one that somehow the bodies were switched and Sarah is in that grave with the wrong name on it? I've tried to find out where people were taken, what funeral homes were taken. I haven't done a thorough, thorough search uh, but the records would be so long gone at this point, I think. Uh, if, if Sarah was mis misidentified and brought to New York, where was Carrie taken? Where is she buried? I also did a little, in my research, I found that there was an orphan's home set up after the Civil War, four orphans of the Civil War, and it was in Elmira. So, that could have been where our buddy Sarah got on, on the train as well. Did she get on with her grandmother? Or had she been placed in an orphan's home, an orphanage, and was she being sent back down, down south or someplace else? And is that why she was on the train? Anyway, it's a very contemplative, a very interesting ghost story. And I don't think we've reached the end of it yet. We'd sure like to see that these two little spirits are resting in peace. And for us to go peacefully back to whatever we have to do now, like make dinner. Whoops, I see the first robin in my backyard. Hmm, that looks good. Anyway, here's Cross River Reservoir as it appears today. Kind of the same, the same view that we saw way back in Chapman Miller's uh, postcard from about 1910. So Dana, I'm done. And if anybody's still around. Oh, Maureen, nobody left. You still oh, no. got everyone attached. No, no. <laughs> okay, well, uh, let's see what- you Ready for some questions? Yeah, I don't know if I know the answers, but let's try. Okay, we'll start with who named the cemetery Boot Hill? Oh, I think just the people that own that property. That, um, that goes back behind, uh, yeah, that's not, that has nothing to do really. Don't, the Reynolds did not name it Boot Hill. So I think that's private, that's on private property. Are there any remnants of the railroads? Oh, like there are out by Mill River in yeah. uh, Lewisboro? I don't think, I don't think it got, no, I don't think it got anywhere near here. I think it, it got as far, if it got anywhere to Armonk. Okay. They did not even get to building the berms like they did out in uh, Cross River. I mean, out in Lewisboro. This one might really stretch your brain, Maureen. You ready? Okay. Yeah. Dr. Bailey, did he develop the Bailey scale, a, a form of IQ testing used up until 1970s? Yes. Um, he was, was him. He was part of that. Yeah. He, he was a very uh, well known. Uh, psychiatrist, as I said, and he was involved with a lot of that. So I'm pretty sure he had early work, but he died in 1922. So his work would have been, uh, the name may have just survived, you know, as uh, through the years, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that would have been him. Okay, I asked the question Please, wrong, but I go back him. one, sorry. Okay. The, uh, the Boutonville Railroad, is there any remnants to that? The Boutonville I Express? <laughs> I don't think so. We all drive by there every day. There might, if you want to go looking in the, the weeds, there might be some spikes. But uh, I From think building that great big dam, there's no. I know 
the aqueduct in Croton, uh, the, I mean, they brought stuff in to build the Croton Dam and there's not much left there either, so. Right, to do when I, uh, a lot of that information in the pictures are in my book, Images of Lewisboro. And to do that chapter, I went down to the public works office at uh, Kensico Dam and they let me go through their files to uh, get pictures and, uh, and read some of the reports and things. So uh, uh, I don't even know them. You'd have to find out where the, the, the Mountainville Express ran, but um, I'm sure if uh, it wasn't that worthy back 110 years ago. So I don't know what you could find. It'd be fun to look though. Do you know the name of the family whose sons would climb up the highest trees and place a flag? One was still there on a pro the property near the vet's office in 1985. Um, I don't know. And it might have been the Grammases. Because uh, uh, Gra Ken, uh, Ken Grammas had the, uh, the Exile drugstore in, in Cross River till he retired. And uh, he had a couple of sons that were into that. And one of them um, is buried up in Cross River Cemetery because he was killed in a tragic skiing accident as a college student. But he would have been at John Jay around that time. Uh, I think there was more than one. I think there it was a thing to do. But, but I was here at that point, but my kids were not into, weren't old enough to climb trees or if my girls, climb the rock in Katona to paint the soccer, go, go John Jay. So I can claim the soccer, the rock painters in Katona, but I can't claim the tree climbers at Cross River. Okay. Um, the O'Neill farm, is it on the same side as Todd Road or? Yeah, yep. Yeah. It's, it's just before, it, <clears throat> and I think somebody's built a house along there, but I think it's, it's still open area. But it's it's as you're getting closer to Todd Road, but it's on the same side. Okay. Um, can you still walk over the dam? Yeah, you can walk over it, but you can't drive. It's they had just opened it up to driving and biking and walking when 9/11 happened, and then they closed it up. So you could. They had redone it, and uh, I remember driving over it before 9/11, and. Uh, and they closed it and it's now open so you can bike it and you can ride it and you can walk it but you can't drive it i mean you could if they opened it but yeah where i was lucky well there's a way right maureen pardon where there's a will there's a way uh, well yeah especially i put on my historian's hat and knock down the barricade and i'll do it again <laughs> Um, your ghost story with Carrie and Sarah is that in your ghost book? No, because it was too. It was too. Uh, I just I only learned it about five years ago. Uh, not even five years ago. About three years ago. So it's, it doesn't have to be in the next ghost book. It's uh, I tell it whenever I do ghost, uh, you know, programs. But it was too late for the uh, for the ghost book. It has to be in another one. So. You'll have to watch it on YouTube from what we just did. Somebody is curious about the quarry on Todd Road near Cross River. I see it on the old maps and I noticed that there is a picture of it in the Lewisboro history book. Is it around the corner? Oh, from their own house. It looks like it's still there. Can you say a bit about what it's it on the It's on the corner for? of Mount Holly and Todd. Uh, Bob or Shannon, do, you can unmute yourself and help me out with this question a little Is bit. Is there another one? Yeah, thanks. We just wondered what it would have been used for. Oh, well, building, I think, uh, oh, shoot, I've, I've seen, uh, it might be in the Blue History book, whoever wrote about that part, it was committee, but it was used locally. I, you know, for building, it might even have been used in the, 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 the the Brady, the Brady House Foundation or something, but um, it was used locally. I don't think it was used in the dam, but you're talking about the, the, the quarry that's near Mount Holly and Todd Road, right? 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, you drive by it and it's clear that there's like an excavation oh, there. Yeah, they, they did a lot of quarrying out of there. But I, off the top of my head, I, I don't know what it was. Uh, it was used locally by a lot of, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, people. Great, thank you. How can we find Bear Rock, Maureen? I don't have my res map in front of me, but it's definitely um, in the brochure that you you get um, when you you know get one of those hiking hiking trail maps. It's on that. Um, I think Rose helped out too on yeah. the Rocks Trail. Right. That's that's yeah. That's a newer trail. It used to be on its own little trail, but yeah, there's this Rocks Trail, which has the rock shelter, bear rock, and other rocks in the res. Now we're gonna go way back to your favorite photo of all the people uh, picnicking in Cross River. Oh, okay. <laughs> what was hanging from the tree in that picture? Oh dear. Oh dear oh, is right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me hit escape. Uh, I don't, I, I wish, I, I'm just gonna go away. I'm afraid to close everything up or we'll lose it all. I probably could just go to the pictures. We're almost there. Uh, while you're, oh, there you go. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. Went, went too far. It's oh, they're jackets. Yeah, they're jackets. I don't know what this looks like. It might be a barrel. Wait, I'm... But these are, these are coats. Oh, Emily, I see you unmuted. Help me out. I I thought they at first they were skins or something, but no, they're coats, I guess. Yep, they are coats. They are coats. Okay. Thank I'm not you. Sure, I'm not sure what this is, but could it be a big hat? Well, that's about as as zoomy as we can get. Looks like looks like it's a, a hat. It has to fit a really big head. <laughs> We can stay at the picnic. It's a nice picture, right? I love that picture, yeah. I'm um, Dawn, you might have to help me out here. On the Cross River map of 1904, which would be the Craighead house? Okay, it probably says, it would. that was a Silkman house. Yeah, hi Maureen, it's Dawn Lyons, how are you? Hi there. Oh, Dawn. Yeah. Yeah. You have all uh, these pictures I want. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, switch. I like yours. You like mine. Okay. Uh, I was looking at the map and, you know, I know the Craighead family very well. And I just right. couldn't figure out which house was theirs. Uh, on, this on is the Cross River map. Yeah, okay. I'm this is at, like Morris Webb or Dr. Stowe. Yeah. I don't know who Dr. Stowe is. Let's look at the other one. Uh, not next, but 1858. I would say it would be Webb, but it was a Silkman house. Okay. So I'm surprised Silkman doesn't show up there. Uh, where are we here? Um, okay. I gotta find my mountain bell. This is coming in. Um, I don't know. Here's here here's here's the Reynolds house. This is the Gambrel roofed house. So that Silkman house is going to be kind of across the street. Right. But it might be the unnamed one, unless or Mead had two. But this this is the Gambrel. This is where Lois was born. This this is the Reynolds house where the Barons live. Yeah, where the um, barons live, right? So, uh, Silkman's was uh, Craighead's is just one way or the other, right across. Okay, thank you. Um, that so what it was when? Um, I don't I don't know the history of, of that house, like who built it, but it looks like it would might have been the web. I don't think it was that. I think that Dr. Stowe. The house next to that was Lydia Green, and that was next to Chapman Miller. Those were all those houses that were 
bunched together that made the way for Yellow Monkey Village. Whoops, well, we can stay at the map. What's the next question there, Dana? So yeah. is the Reynolds house the fencing house now? They they have the fencing sign out? Uh, I don't know who lives there now. Oh, oh, the Reynolds, you mean the, the homestead? Marianne, you want to jump on and clear? I know yes. Lois does not live in the fencing house now. I, Lois you know, if it was, uh, you, actually, you answered my question, the Barons. So the Barons house is the Reynolds house which is now that fencing house. Okay, yeah, I don't, I um, don't, oh, oh, I know, oh, fencing. I was thinking of fencing to keep people out. Oh, no, no, fencing. The fencing where people do fencing, right. Uh, yeah, and then Lois lives next door to that on the east in the yes, 1930s house. Thank you. Oh, the other Marianne has a question. No, I'm, I'm confirming what Marianne just said. The um, the Reynolds house, the big one with the mansard roof and the two gorgeous sycamore trees. Not you, mansard, Gabriel. Gabriel, whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in, in the, details, Maureen. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Wrong century. Um, that was the Baron house, yes. And the, and the fella who is, teaches fencing lives there now. Okay. And, is, and Reynolds is, the address is Mark Mead Road for Reynolds house, I believe. It's, uh, it's no, fine. it's, 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 uh, well, their mail goes to a route 35 number. Oh, okay. So I'm the one who asked the flag question. Oh, um, okay. Well then maybe, you know, and I thought that when you said Craighead, that's the name I remember. Uh, and they, and the house okay. they lived in, this is my recollection from the early eighties was they lived in one of those houses by the where the vet where the cross they lived were. they lived they were the vets okay the craighead uh we all probably know tom craighead uh he was the last craighead brother around here yes. um but his his father was craighead vets and they were very famous vets they they did a lot of uh show dog vets for they were the vets for Anybody around here who had, uh, uh, well, actually Tony Townsend, he took his dogs there because he told me about it on his, an email he sent me. So uh, it was, uh, I th they, they also raised dogs there, I believe, but the Craig has lived in that house and then uh, uh, they, they left town and moved away, uh, it became the, Cross River Kennels or whatever, but yeah, that and that goes back to being silkman and goes back to whoever Dawn is trying to figure out who lived there. Right, right. Anyone else have any other questions? I think I got them all that were written in the chat. Or anybody with other reminiscences or anything that that will put Cross River on back on the map. If not, we'll let y'all go home. Or you're all Make home. Dinner. They're all home now. They're all home. <laughs> They're all home. Oh, bummer. Well, maybe we'll get to that July 4th picnic that President Biden talked about. Maureen, let's remind them in two more weeks, March oh, 28th, what hamlet are we doing? We are doing Lewisboro. And I want everybody to consider this. Uh, it had always, it's, always been a hamlet, but it could not have been Lewisboro Hamlet until after 1840. So that's the conundrum. What was it called before it was called Lewisboro Hamlet? Because we weren't Lewisboro until 1840, so we couldn't have had a Lewisboro Hamlet until after 1840. Stop by in two weeks and let's see if anybody has a good answer to that. I don't. And then we're going to do South Salem two weeks after that. And then two weeks after that, we're going to end up at the end of the alphabet with Lockabuck, which uh, I'll probably include some of the three lakes as well because they're kind of far away from downtown South Salem and uh, there'll be enough to talk about it's South Salem, so I think we'll do Wakabuck and uh, the Three Lakes area.
Okay. With that, everyone else enjoy your Sunday. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again in two weeks as we uh, go through Lewisboro. Thank you.